Gorlitz. I'm the Fellowship and Academic Programs Manager at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and one of the co-organizers of today's conference. Um, and I want to thank you all so much for being here and to those online for tuning in. Several years back when Melissa DeBacchus, who was then a senior Terra Foundation fellow at SAM, proposed to sculpture curator Karen Lemmy and myself the idea for a conference on Italo-American cultural relations, the idea seemed like a natural fit for our museum. As Karen will outline in her remarks to follow, Sam's collections offer unexpected insights into American artists' fascination with and presence in Italy. And we were eager to put the latest scholarship in, on the subject in dialogue with our holdings in the galleries upstairs. Yet our enthusiasm for today's convening was also motiva motivated by the museum's long and pronounced history of scholarly engagement with this very topic. As many of you may know, SAM is home to the preeminent residential fellowship program for the study of art in the of the United States. Inaugurated in 1970, the program has hosted more than 500 fellows and 200 visiting scholars. We celebrate our 50th anniversary in 2020. Our fellows include PhD candidates writing their dissertations, as well as postdoctoral and senior scholars. Their resulting dissertations and publications have added immeasurably to our understanding of America's artistic heritage and its cultural formation. In reviewing today's program, the papers for which were chosen from a pool of over 50 proposals, we realized that more than half of our speakers are current or former SAM fellows. And I promise this did not factor into the decision making. <laughs> In my comments today, I want to consider the ways in which SAM has served as a crucible for much of the work that has and is still being done on the long love affair between America and Italy. A number of foundational texts and dissertations on the topic of 19th century American artists' engagement with Italy have been researched and written at SAM. These include dissertations by Douglas Highland in 1985 on Lorenzo Bartolini and Italian influences on American sculptors in Florence, Sarah Fus Parrott in 1988 on the careers of American women writers and artists in Italy, and Janet Headley, also in 1988, on English literary and aesthetic influences on American sculptors. The same year that Janet Headley was in residence here, Alan Wallach, now Ralph H. Wark Professor Emeritus at the College of William and Mary, received a postdoctoral fellowship at the museum to research Thomas Cole's patronage. Wallach would later serve as guest curator, our, along with our own William Trutner, of the museum's 1994 exhibition, Thomas Cole Landscape into History. The catalog for the show seen here included an essay by another former museum postdoc, J. Gray Sweeney, as well as Wallach's own piece, Thomas Cole and the Course of American Empire, which charted Cole's merging of history and landscape painting with works such as the Course of Empire series that combined imagery of the old and new world to offer a moralizing message to his fellow citizens. In recent decades, Sam fellows such as Nancy Palm and William Coleman have built upon this earlier scholarship in their dissertations on Cole. And most recently, we welcomed Yale University's Tim Berenger, who together with this morning's presenter, Betsy Kornhauser, is organizing the Met's upcoming exhibition, Thomas Cole's Journey, Atlantic Crossings. Berenger came to SAM in 2015 to lead a seminar for our fellows on American art in the Atlantic world. Here you see him in the gallery with our John Singleton Copley. Other major scholarly projects with roots here at the museum include Kirsten Buick's dissertation on the Roman-based sculptor Ammonia Lewis, which was later published as the monograph Child of Fire. Buick's predoctoral fellowship in 1994 overlapped with the museum's acquisition of Lewis's massive marble sculpture Cleopatra. Here you see the sculpture rescued from a Chicago salvage yard a century after its completion. More recently, Caitlin Beach, whom you heard from this morning, 
took up the topic of race, slavery, and sculpture as Sam's Joe and Wanda Korn predoctoral fellow. Beach spent her year in residence developing a chapter on Hiram Power's Greek slave, a sculpture that, as she spoke about this morning, was created in Power's Florence studio, but that drew crowds in antebellum America where it was marketed and exhibited in both abolitionist and slaveholding strongholds, such as New Orleans. Jane Deeney, who this morning focused on gender and class in her talk on Sargent and Duvenac, held a predoctoral fellowship at SAM in 1997, 1998, to write her dissertation on Sargent. And a decade later, in 2008, Alex Mann, who is now SAM's curator of prints and drawings, received a Terra Foundation predoctoral fellowship for his dissertation in progress, which considers how American travelers to Italy in the first half of the 19th century were exposed to new concepts of gender and sexuality, as well as new visual ideals for the male body. It might seem surprising that Sam Fellows have also focused on the Italian side of the equation. During his tenure as a Smithsonian Regents Fellow in 1988, Albert Boehm completed his manuscript for the Art of the Macchia and the Risorgimento, published in 1993 a publication that drew attention to this group of Italian artists' engagement with the political movement. And in 2000, Maria Elena Versari, then a doctoral candidate at the Scuola Normale Superior Pisa, came to SAM to develop her dissertation on futurism and its positioning vis-a-vis -vis other international avant-garde, including those in the United States. This afternoon, you'll hear from Sergio Cortesini, Marin Sullivan, and Erica Doss, all of whom have held fellowships at SAM. Marin's actually with us right now. Cortesini, one of the co-organizers of our conference, came to the museum in 2005 as a Joshua C. Taylor postdoctoral fellow to work on his project about art and national identity in fascist Italy and New Deal America. He later won the museum's inaugural Terra Foundation for American Art International Essay Prize in 2010, which led to this publication, an article entitled Invisible Canvases, Italian Painters and Fascist Myths Across the American <laughs> Scene. It was published in the 2011 volume of American Art, our museum's peer-reviewed journal, co-published with the University of Chicago Press. Since Cortesini's publication, I hear from our executive editor, submissions by Italian scholars to the museum's journal have greatly increased. And as a side note, I will put in a shameless plug here that American Art will be accepting submissions over the course of the coming year for the next International Essay Prize. And this is an award for non-US scholars working on American art topics. The Terra Foundation Fellowships at SAM, established in 2006, have supported three additional Italian scholars since that time. French-based Italian art historians Riccardo Venturi and Luciano Kelles came to SAM in 2006 and 2007 to study, in the first case, the impact of Italian sources on Mark Rothko, and in the second, the influence of Piero della Francesca on 20th century US artists. Kellis's article on Grant Wood and Piero de la Francesca was published last year in American Art. And also last year, Michele Amade, a doctoral candidate in the Pegasus program of the universities of Florence, Siena, and Pisa, spent his tenure as a Terra Foundation pre-doc conducting research in US archives and collections about the impact of Fl the Florence Academy of Fine Arts on the work of US painters and sculptors who trained and exhibited there in the first half of the 19th century. These included figures like Thomas Cole, Horatio Greeno, Randolph Rogers, John Gadsby Chapman, and Minor Kilborn Kellogg. Here you see work by the latter two artists that is in the US Capitol and Sam's collection. As I hope you can see, this week's conference has been a joy to organize because it's so naturally developed in concert with Sam's research department. Melissa DeBacchus, the driving force behind this conference, has been engaging with the museum's Research and Scholars Center for nearly two decades. 
1999, Tabakis came to Sam on a short-term visitor appointment to con conduct preliminary research for her book, A Sisterhood of Sculptors, American Artists in 19th Century Rome. In this publication, Tabakis examines the careers of a group of American female sculptors who settled in Rome in the mid-19th century. Sculptors such as Harriet Hosmer, Edmonia Lewis, Anne Whitney, Vinnie Ream, and Emma Stebbins. Her book reveals the gendered nature of creativity and expatriation, of, of creativity, and also paints a vibrant portrait of expatriate life in mid-19th century Italy, a time of Italian unification and the descent of the United States into civil war. As you've heard, Debacus returned to Sam as a senior fellow in 2013, and deeply impressed by her work, we invited her back last year to serve as the guest professor of our annual seminar for Sam Fellows, generously funded also by the Terra Foundation. Here you see her and curator Karen Lemmy leading the fellows through Karen's exhibition on Hiram Power's Greek Slave, which was part of a fascinating seminar on American art and gender in a transatlantic context. So these examples, while numerous, are just a sampling of projects that demonstrate Sam's sustained investment in scholarship on Italo-American artistic relations. Through not only fellowships, but also our seminars, our journal, and our symposia, the museum has had the privilege of supporting groundbreaking research on this topic by several generations of scholars. And judging from the response to our conference call for papers, again, over 50 submissions, we can look forward to continuing the scholarly dialogue beyond today's conference and well into the future, I hope. So now I would like to take a moment to introduce my colleague and friend, Karen Lemmy, who I have been truly delighted with, to, delighted to work with on the organization of this conference. Dr. Lemmy has been the Smithsonian American Art Museum's curator of sculpture since 2012. Her recent projects at the museum include Asamu Noguchi, Archaic Modern, co-curated with Dakin Hart, senior curator at the Noguchi Museum, and that came out in 2016. Measured Perfection, Hiram Power's Greek Slave, organized in 2015, and an installation of 20th century direct carving, mostly drawn from the museum's permanent collection, also in 2015. Before joining our museum, Lemmy was a research associate at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and served as the Monuments Coordinator for the City of New York's Department of Parks and Recreation. She was an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Fellow at the New York Historical Society and also an Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow at the National Gallery of Art. Lemmy holds a doctorate in art history and a certificate in American studies from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So please welcome Dr. Lemmy. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Uh, I'd like first to recognize Amelia for her unflagging attention to every detail, every last detail, and sharp scholarly insight. Uh, I think every field in art history should have their own Amelia. She, <laughs> she has really done so much for organizing American art, excuse me, has done so much for American art from organizing our many symposia to shepherding quite a few of those 500 fellows through the program. Um, so thank you, Amelia. And of course, I am deeply grateful to Melissa DeBacchus for igniting that spark and um, really b building this conference up from that, uh, that idea back in 2014. I'm not presenting a formal paper. Rather, this is an invitation to explore the collection at SAM with the theme of the conference in mind. And permit me to pull back a little from the rise and fall of empires and look more broadly. In 1966, Irving Penn's camera captured Vladimir Nabokov in Italy chasing butterflies. 
and I call this a useful metaphor as we hunt for other evidence of Italy in the museum's collections. My searches through our database have taken me to the wildest places and yielded well over a thousand objects that have everything to do with Italy. Nearly every decade of our nation's history, every area of our collection, every medium, offered something wonderful. Just to give you a superficial sense of where the search took me, I point to Robert Duncanson's Pompeii on the right, a well-trafficked ruin Pompeii by the mid-19th century, as well as Volterra by Elihu Vedder, a place that I suppose we might say was off the beaten path, as well as these beautiful views of Venice by Thomas Moran and Everett Warner from the first decade of the 20th century to the very recent work of Angela Lorenz. Um, I was rather struck to learn that this is a watercolor. Um, I, it, it's, it's really a remarkable work on paper. And uh, this meticulously rendered intimate view of the 17th century dissection room at the University of Bologna. And I'm sure some of you are conjuring up, I hope, images of Thomas Aiken's Gross Clinic. Sam's rich collection of folk art and works by self-taught artists also reflect the lasting significance of Italy in America, especially in the paintings of Ralph Fasanella, a self-taught artist and son of Italian immigrants. He, is the, he it was the subject of an exhibition here in 2014. And his Iceman Crucified number four from our collection is channeling any number of Italian Renaissance paintings. Decorative arts collection, for which Renwick is so well known, includes the work of Lino Tagliapietra, Murano master glass artist, who for decades has divided his time between Venice and the Pacific Northwest. Tagliapietra was also the subject of an exhibition uh, at the Renwick in 2008. While on the right, you see the work of MacArthur Fellow Ubaldo Vitaldi, a silver terrine for risotto alla pescatore, perfect after lunch. Vitaldi is a fourth generation silversmith and conservator who hails from Rome and lives and works in New Jersey. And of course, there are the countless examples of American artists who spent time in Italy inventing allegories from Daniel Huntington's Italy to Paul Cadmus's Night in Bologna, an enigmatic allegory of another kind, full of charged gazes and painted with egg tempera, as did Montaigne. There are many gifts from grand tourists including some that were transferred to the Smithsonian very early on, shortly after our founding in 1846, such as this stone head believed to represent Ceres, which may not actually be an antiquity after all, <laughs> or the stunning collection of actually Roman glass, I think earlier it had been said Venetian, but it's Roman glass that was given by John Galatly in 1929 much of which is on view above us in the loose center on the third floor. A reminder that the museum now known as SAM, at long last known as SAM, didn't always focus exclusively on American art. I wouldn't hold out that the next Raphael or Correggio to make the news will be discovered in storage, and these really are in the collection. <laughs> But we have plenty of other treasures. And so in these remaining minutes, please indulge me as curator of sculpture to focus on the third dimension. Pound for pound, this is where we find tons of Italy. After all, nothing could compete with the purity of Carrara marble. Foremost, perhaps, is Horatio Grino's George Washington, cast off from Congress and spared from being thrown into the Potomac, as some 19th century senators suggested. It's now preserved in the collection of Sam, although admittedly it's been on view at our sister museum, the National Museum of American History on the Mall. It's doubtful Greeno could have made this monument anywhere but Italy. And while many scholars have looked into the iconography and the history of this commission, 
we have yet to fully explore what this sculpture meant to the Italians who watched and literally helped, helped it take shape in Florence. And I'm grateful to our former fellow uh, aforementioned Michele Amadei for raising some of these issues in his research at SAM and encouraging us to think as well about George Washington's significance as an inspirational leader in progressive circles in Tuscany in the 19th century. Another transfer from Congress, the dying Tecumseh, as in the dying Gaul, by Ferdinand Petrick, studied in Rome with Bertel Torvaldsen and left the Eternal City for Washington, D.C., where he was sure he could secure a commission from Congress. He did not. But while here, he sculpted several portraits of Native American leaders who were in the capital to negotiate treaties. And some of these studies informed his very imaginative portrayal of Tecumseh, who was in fact long dead by Petrick's time. For all its historical inaccuracies, this sculpture points to the global connections that are made through the capital cities of Rome and Washington. So Petrick is born in Dresden, studies in Rome, lived in Washington, in fact, he sculpted Tecumseh while living in Brazil and then sent it to Washington. And yet, his life ends in Rome where he retired on a pension from the Vatican in exchange for his models. And I show you here uh, a plaster or perhaps terracotta version of Tecumseh in the Vatican Museum's collections. I'll move past the neoclassical to 1894 and the founding of the American Academy in Rome, which became such an important epicenter for sculptors in particular, most of whom were, by the end of the century, more interested in working in bronze than marble. Here we find Herman Atkins McNeil, one of the first recipients of the Academy's William Reinhardt Scholarship, specifically for sculptors. McNeil was famous for bringing with him to Rome in 1896 several plasters and studies of Native Americans he had made after visiting the American Southwest. But he also brought with him primitive chant, which you see here, that was based on a model who purportedly danced with Buffalo Bill's show in Chicago, where McNeil worked during the World's Fair of 1893. You're probably at this point wondering why Victor Emmanuel III is next to him. Well, McNeil was not the first American to sculpt Indians in Italy, but it's worth noting that Victor Emmanuel III expressed an interest in acquiring a cast of the primitive chant. And I haven't been able to confirm if the cast was ever purchased, but I found it remarkable that this, this work had attracted the king's attention. And then there is Alexander Finister Proctor, unmistakably associated with Denver and the West. And you see him here in his full Western outdoorsman regalia with his loaded <laughs> rifle. Also a recipient of the Reinhardt Fellowship and who uh, returned once again to the Academy later in life as a fellow in 1925. His talking panther on the left returns us to American shores and the legacy of Italian immigrants, for it was cast at Roman bronze works. And this perhaps is um, something that, that adds complexity to the Italian American immigrant population uh, in New York at the end of the 19th century. For the Roman bronze works foundry was the first lost wax foundry to be established in the United States, a place that would cast untold numbers of bronzes from small statuettes to public monuments, founded in 1899 by Riccardo Bertelli, an immigrant from Genoa, so the Italian immigrant as entrepreneur. And you can just make out uh, Frederick Remington's model on the left there. Paul Manship also cast his works at Roman Bronze Foundry. And I just include him uh, with this wonderful image of him that signed Rome uh, when he was in fact at the American Academy as a fellow. And perhaps uh, some of you may know he was also a commissioner of this museum. So a wonderfully direct connection from 
the Academy to Sam through the life of Paul Manship. In Chasing Butterflies, I came to see Italy had penetrated the collection in a profound way, even reaching into the imaginations of artists who never really left New York, such as Joseph Cornell. Sam is home to the Joseph Cornell Study Center, which houses countless objects, mainly source material for his sophisticated assemblages, boxes, and collages, such as the Denison Cake Boxes, made by Denison Manufacturing Company Paper Box Factory. And I'm showing you this um, trove of Denison Cake Boxes. They're, they're only about this big each. And surprise, they included images of Medici, works by Piero della Francesca, and de Chirico. And here, reinforcing de Chirico's presence, I show you once again Irving Penn, photograph of de Chirico, um, who was captured on this photograph by Penn in Rome in 1944, when Penn was there as a volunteer in the American Field Service. By 1966, Sam, then known as the National Collection of Fine Arts, was literally on Italian soil, sponsoring and organizing the United States pavilions at the Venice Biennale from 1966 to 1972. The National Collection of Fine Arts stepped in after the United States Information Agency decided to cease funding U.S. participation in all international Biennale art exhibitions. And it's anybody's guess what's inside that crate, but this was cataloged as being um, a, a crate that was shipped from this museum. And so uh, it's on its way to the 33rd Biennale, the first one that this museum participated in, and it's probably a work by either Helen Frankenthaler, Ellsworth Kelly, Roy Lichtenstein, or Jules Olitsky, the four artists that were sent to that exhibition. In wrapping up, I was quite struck while researching Martin Purrier's sculpture Vessel, one of our recent acquisitions, to find that even this work had a close connection to Italy. Purrier was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome and his first iteration of this sculpture was included in an exhibition there. Uh, the sculpture dates from between 1997 and 2002. Perrier, as he sometimes does, famously worked on this, changing it over the years. But you can see in this early version on the floor in the American Academy on the right, that he's, um, he's removed the soil, added the arches that correspond to ears on this human head lying face down on the ground. And he's also added a tar and mesh ampersand and a wooden sphere. I love thinking about the Academy as a laboratory for contemporary American artists. So I've focused closely on the collection at SAM and I hope and invite all of you upstairs where I hope you can take a closer look for, look for yourselves and chase some butterflies too. Now, now for the introductions. So, thank you. Sergio Cortesini is an assistant professor of modern, of modern and contemporary art history at the Università di Pisa, a recipient of postdoctoral fellowships from the Getty 2005 and Smithsonian American Art Museum 2006. Cortesini has published on Italian fascist and American New Deal art from comparative and transcultural perspectives as well as on more contemporary artists, more recently on Emilio Vedova's emotionally charged gestural paintings and Damien Hirst's post-humanist treatment of death. He was awarded the inaugural Terra International Essay Prize from Sam in 2010 for his essay, Invisible Canvases, Italian Painters and Fascist Myths Across the American Scene. Cortesini holds a doctorate from Sapienza University, Uni Università di Roma, as well as 
a diploma in social anthropology from the Ecole des Hautes Etudes. Peter Benson Miller is the Andrew High School Arts Director at the American Academy in Rome, an art historian and curator. He received a master's degree from Williams College and a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU. He coordinated guest lectures and scholarly symposia at the Service Cultural at the Musée d'Orsay and co-curated Delacroix à Renoir in 2002. Philip Gustin Roma, which he curated at the Museo Carlo Bilotti, also traveled to the Phillips collection. At the Academy, his exhibitions include Cy Twombly, Photographer, 2015, Studio Systems, 2016, and Charles Ray, Mountain Lion Attacking a Dog, 2017. He is the editor of Go Figure, New Perspectives on Gustin, published in 2015. And our last speaker for this session, before our coffee break, Marin Sullivan, PhD, University of Michigan, is Assistant Professor of Art History at Keene State College. Prior to her appointment, she served as a Henry Moore Foundation Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the University of Leeds. Sullivan recently published Sculptural Materiality in the Age of Conceptualism, 2017, and is co-editor Post-War Italian Art Today, Untying the Knot. While American Sculpture and Archi I'm sorry, while American Sculpture and Architecture at Mid-Century, will, she will be a George Gurney postdoctoral fellow, she is a George Gurney postdoctoral fellow here at SAM. And she is soon to be a Tyson Scholar at Crystal Bridges Museum of Art. Sullivan is also co-curating a major retrospective exhibition on Harry Bertoya, scheduled to open at the Nasher Sculpture Collection in 2019. Please welcome our first speaker, Sergio. <coughs> Thank you very much, my deepest thanks to, uh, to, to Melissa for her, her enthusiasm and for bringing all us together around this project here today. And uh, to Amelia and Karen, what can I say that hasn't been already said, but uh, their invaluable work uh, was really fundamental in organization of this project. And on a more personal uh, note, I can say that Washington is a, the city of Southern Italy where I've been living most of my time and uh, at where I feel most at home. And uh, being a fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum many years ago was uh, one of the most important privileges in my life as a scholar. And uh, I came back many times after that. Uh, the Archives of American Art has been al always the center of my research. So uh, I feel such a really strong uh, personal connection. And I hope that this chance will be, um, will be just uh, one in a, in a series of future events that will bring us together again. So the New Deal art programs have been investigated from a variety of perspectives for the efforts in restoring the American dream and a sense of hope during the Depression. But here in this talk, I will narrow my, pro my focus on the program of mural decorations of federal buildings in Washington, D.C and post offices and courthouses across the country administrated by the section of painting or sculpture that was a division that operated within the Treasury Department uh, between 1935 and 1943. And we'll look at the agency of the myth of the Italian Renaissance. My aim is to investigate the paradox of the critical appropriation of the Italian past in the service of a burgeoning American art that claim to be democratic, unique, and drawn from the heartland of the country. Unlike the short-lived PWAP, that is the Public Works of Art Project, and the Federal Art Project, both relief programs for needy artists, the section commissioned quality murals for federal buildings with the aim of disseminating fine art and celebrating local history, productivity, family, 
gender cooperation in communities where no museum or public art existed, as well as in the hope of inspiring faith in a rosier future. The section was directed or informally inspired by painter and lawyer Edward Bruce, okay, the chief of the section. Um, Edward Rowe, and this is the guy who was pointing to Jane Dini uh, earlier on, uh, who was, uh, um, was a former gallery director and educator, um, who served as the superintendent uh, to the section, and uh, uh, former editor of the arts magazine Forbes Watson, and George Biddle, all had prior experiences of Italy from travels or temporary residence. Bruce and Biddle lived for some years next to painter Maurice Stern in Anticoli Corrado, a small village near Rome. I'd argue that their direct observation of Italian artwork seen on the walls of churches in the squares of towns while it was still integrated in the social fabric for example, artifacts cherished by popular worship or civic pride, and not isolated as gallery pictures, was seminal in instilling the awareness of art as a factor of a communal identity and social cohesion. As Bruce once said to Stern in 1939, in announcing two major mural commissions in Washington, quote, I have it in the back of my mind that we may somehow find an opportunity to do the series of murals for bread that we discuss so many times in Anticoli. This suggests that the programs of economic support to artists through state patronage originated, if merely as a discursive hypothesis, in Italy before the stock market crash. The unemployment and the collapse of the market in the Depression confirmed the validity of their speculations. It is not by chance that Biddle, through a letter he wrote to President Roosevelt on May 9, 1933, six months after his return from Anticoli, is credited as the originator of the PWAP, the first bread program for artists that FDR called Bruce himself to head. The narrative articulated by Bruce and his fellows for the PWP first uh, and then for the section was an attack on what they called the quote unquote star system of artists whose commercial value was subject to the speculative fluctuations of the art market of the 20s. They criticized the aloofness of vanguard aesthetics and artists in ivory towers, called for a redefinition of the artist as a citizen and for his cooperation with the patronage of the state for the sake of a socially meaningful art that could, be, that could open new horizons of beauty and spiritual wealth. While these tenets were not new, they were now made resonate with the social role of art in Italian medieval communes in a far-reaching historical parallelism. In the first official bulletin of the section, published in March 1935, the Director of Procurement of the Treasury Department stated that the section, by committing itself to select the best works on the basis of artistic excellence and availing itself of the advice of artists and laymen of proved faith in the development of art and spiritual life, replicated the spirit of Florentine patrons and artists who acted following the strictest artistic standards on account of their shared faith in the glory of Florence. In 1934, in a tirade against the perversions of the art market, Forbes Watson praised the PWP for reforming the productive base of the artist, quote, changing him into an active citizen raising him once more to the dignity of the artisan and finally bringing a whole new audience into direct cooperation with him." Unquote. Bruce explained on American Magazine of Art that before 1520 virtually no painting was made without a commission and envisioned scores of average artists 
among their fellow folks rather than misfit geniuses. The average artist parallels the sociological model of the average man cherished by New Dealers. And Bruce assured that, quote, masterpieces and great geniuses are not produced from isolated efforts. A large body, if, if, if the history of art is any criterion, they come only from large art movements. A large body of work and a large number of artists are necessary to produce the Leonardos, the Piero della Francescas, the Michelangelos, unquote. American masters uh, would emerge like their um, Italian precursors uh, out of a vibrant art practice integrated into the body politic. These arguments were nurtured by the fantasy of a return to the guild system. The trouble, Maurice Stein wrote in, to Bruce in 1937, is the maladjustment of the artist to, to life. Formerly, that is centuries ago, the artists belonged to the master craftsman guilds who received commissions and executed them to the best of their ability. This relationship between the artist and the, his public eh, gradually disappeared, which gave rise to the greatest evil of the past two centuries, the easel pictures. <laughs> Bruce rep replied, do you continue to think of this matter, and perhaps it will be possible to bring back the old ideal of the master craftsmanship. A friend of mine is making an exhaustive study of how the business was conducted in the old days of the Renaissance, and when I get this report, I will send you a copy. I haven't located this report, but in 1935, the artist Louis Rubenstein published in the American Scholar a plea for the revival of Buon Fresco, and for the spread of this artist return craftsman and social interpreter that was so convincing as to be reprinted in the bulletin. Rubenstein extolled the Italian masters for the architectural quality of their fresco, but also for their social potential. Mastering the technical difficulties of Buon Fresco and following the formalist lessons of Giotto, Masaccio, Piero, della Francesca, and Signorelli, the art of the American social realist could evolve from mere political illustrations into images where the dynamics of forms and colors enhanced their referential content and consequently their social message. Moreover, fresco making, which implies the coordinated effort of architect, plasterer, and painter, epitomized the cooperative synthesis of conflicting interests and uh, professional divisions. The artist Rubenstein contended should not even sign the work, acknowledging it as a collective effort. A traditional medium such as fresco could thus become a conduit for the masses and play, quote, a real part in the solution of the urgent problems of reorganization and revaluation of life. Along the same lines, in 1936, Watson remarked, back of all great mural painting is a social belief. The painter shares this belief with the audience. The government has afforded the artist an incredible opportunity to express, in terms of art, our faith. And he argued that the social belief informed American murals in that social beliefs that inform American Muslims equaled the religious belief that backed 13th century Italian frescoes. The artists consequently had to, to develop a new logic marked by simpler symbol, symbols and broader in its appeal. Indeed, the Italian masters were taken as paradigms for their visual intelligibility and evoked as the standard in terms of the dignity and refinement of styles suitable to murals. In an open letter functioning as a guideline published in the Bulletin in 1940, painter Henry Barnum Poor praised Giotto, Masaccio, Piero for possessing what he deemed to be of the utmost artistic importance, quote, the sense of pictorial necessity a visual freshness and reality which speaks more clearly than any other thing, unquote. Ethel 
For example, Ethel McGaffan was congratulated for this mural depicting Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Her style was compared to that of Piero's battles, and she was recommended not to add action and preserve the dignified and solemn aspect. For several painters, the Quattrocento was a source, a source of true worship. Dreamt last night that I was Piero della Francesca, Biddle wrote in his diary in January 1935. <laughs> he is constantly with me. And while working at this fresco for the Department of Justice building, Piero della Francesca is still my idol and my objective. And Frank Mechow claimed that upon visiting Italy in 1932, he dismissed the hatched complementary colors and began to paint with broad areas of primary colors. I absorb the frescoes of my beloved Piero della Francesca, who represents the most supreme use of plastic elements in the history for me. After Arezzo and Piero come certain giottos at Padua and the color of the Ravenna mosaics. This love for Italian masters, however, rarely translated into blatant imitations. Reginald Marsh proved his devotion to Michelangelo in his fresco, Sorting the Mail, for the Post Office Department building in DC, a composition teeming with torsions of muscular bodies, contrapostos, and foreshortenings from below. George Harding paid homage to Piero's battles in the bodies placed in perspective and in the gesturing of this dispatch rider arriving his arm raised at General Washington's headquarters. Piero had a clearer stylistic influence in Philip Guston's triptych reconstruction and the well-being of the family as noticeable in the detached and fixed facial expressions and in their physiognomies. More often, the admiration for Italian masters transfigured, as it were, in murals that looked modern to contemporary viewers. Despite Biddle's identification with Piero, we wouldn't find much of the Tuscan painter's round style in the American's illustration of the positive effects of justice, which, which juxtaposes the sweatshop and and tenement of yesterday, which are not visible, they are on the side walls of this three-sided murals, uh, fresco actually, uh, and with the order, the family life of today's America here in the center. By including uh, portraits of new dealers compressed and overlapped on a raising plane, the description of indoor narratives as seen through a removed facade, the triptych-like partitioning of the subject matter, Biddle revealed a broader, albeit unspecific, interest in the Italian primitives. In the danger of the post, Mechow betrays his love for Piero, Giotto, and probably Uccello, transforming a violent scene into a visually pleasing and dynamic composition. Bruce reiterated his Italian-American analogy in 19th, April 1938 uh, in the acceptance speech for the Fritzsen Medal, which he was awarded for his merits in the advancement of American art. Artists should not consider commission, sorry, artists should consider commissions as an honor rather than for their financial benefit, he declared. Their moral satisfaction would be, would be higher than the material earning, not unlike Piero's when he created a fresco for his native town. If anyone has any doubt on this point, let him make a pilgrimage to the little town of Borgo San Sepolcro in Tuscany. It is a little town no bigger than some of the places where our artists are working. Piero's financial reward was insignificant, but like the truer artist, he glorified that little chapel. And so it is source today of intense satisfaction to realize that our artists are giving of their best. In another speech at a cabinet meeting with Roosevelt, 
Bruce declared that he pointed artists who received commissions to, quote, a little village I know in Italy called Borgo San Sepolcro. In that village, uh, there is a little town hall, no bigger than the average country post office. Also, in that village lived a great artist, and he painted there the greatest picture in the world. Whenever I am in Italy, I make a pilgrimage to Borgo to see that picture. And I find my soul refreshed from seeing it. I hope the day may come when, me, when we too may develop a Piero della Francesca. In a similar way, a vein, Watson wrote, the mural shows us that it is possible to have not only Rome with its Vatican, but also an Assisi. So in America, the walls of more and more public buildings outside of the great centers will be found adorned with paintings, which to be seen must be visited. What has been done can be done again. So a letter from Edward Rowan from a correspondence with Bruce attests that in 1936 he applied for a grant for a field trip to Italy. And even if the project for some reason did not go through, Rowan stated, it would have been wonderful. And it could have, and it could have brought back something of value for, to the section after seeing the Pieros, the Signorellis, and the Campo Santo at Pisa. But that's all for another time. Rowan, who had joined the section coming from a previous position as director of the little galleries in Cedar Rapids and the Stone City Art Colony, Iowa, was an advocate of Midwestern artists and offered prestigious commissions to the regionalist triumvirate. His Italian journey was not seen as antithetical to the regionalist creed. His project adds a new facet to the practice of field trips recommended to artists and administrators. Rowan and Bruce agreed on the importance of their own trips to check on murals installed, talk with, to the local artist, and stimulate interest in the program. Thus, how could the other trip to Italy bring back something of value if we do not concede that traveling to small towns in Italy amounted to plunging into a historical regionalist geography that somehow mirrored contemporary American geography. If Borgo is a small town America and its chapel the lobby of any post office, this analogy implied a deeper cultural fantasy. The emphasis placed on Pisa, Orvieto, where Signorelli worked, Arezzo, Borgo, Assisi, rather than the achievement of the High Renaissance and Baroque in Rome or Venice, for instance, and on the artist-artisan-citizen nexus, are the clues that I want to elaborate in my conclusion. Bruce and his staff were not alone in believing in the westward translation of artistic leadership. The Italian Renaissance was widely considered the highest achievement in world art, and it was commonly held that it declined after the Italian city-states lost their independence to foreign powers in the 16th century. William Henry Godier, in his popular Renaissance and Modern Art, published in 1900, claimed that, quote, the Renaissance drew its last breath on the shores of the New World with the painters of the American Revolutionary time as an interesting continuation of the old masters. Faithful to the originalist creed in A Treasury of Art Masterpieces 1939, Thomas Craven suggested a link between Giotto, the first artist who reconnected with common human experience, and the Renaissance, a composite of local schools, each conditioned by local psychologies and occupations, and uh, the artists of the American scene. Also, in Men of Art, published in 1940, Craven identified Giotto as the originator of a Western tradition that culminated, quote, driving a straight course to the new, in the new mural art of North America. I mean, I'm, ch I'm choosing uh, the 1900 and 1939 as two examples, but there are other books in the middle, in the, in the other decades, the other years in between in American scholarship. 
Bruce sensed, but Bruce sensed a structural analogy between a specific area of Italian history, and namely the cradle of, it, of early Renaissance in central Italy and its social order of Republican communities and proto-capitalism and New Deal America. This analogy was the interconnection between social capital, that is the attitude of mutual trust and cooperation, cultural capital and economic capital. Bruce was aware that the age of Piero was more oligarchic than the previous century of communal democracy had been and that many artworks were commissioned as forms of self-aggrandizement on the part of individual signori rather than for pleasing the average man. <coughs> Yet, this does not prevent him from the temptation of recasting the New Deal through the myth of the Renaissance, eschewing historical accuracy and drawing from it a set of drama dramatis personae that could be deployed whenever the need arose. Bruce, for instance, compared himself to Pope Julius II for his support to the arts, and Bruce himself was defined as a Renaissance-like man. The narrative of the section falls into a wider trend in American historiography that has looked at the modern quality of the civic world of late medieval republics with their humanism, democracy, and prosperity, and found and found it to resonate with American self-image. Historian Frederick Lane, for instance, wrote in his 1966 uh, History of Venice, quote, my thesis here is that republicanism is the distinctive and significant aspect of these Italian city-states, that republicanism gave to, uh, to the civilization of Italy its distinctive quality and contributed mightily to its triumph later in modern, no, in modern no, nations and primarily in our own. I argue that even one of the most influential recent books of political theory about contemporary Italy, Robert Putnam, Making a Democracy Work of 1993, reads historical facts through this same American lens, so fascinated by the Renaissance. Putnam accounts from the north-south divide in Italy today, tracing its origins in the history of the communes of central northern regions with their active citizenry, guilds and clubs that led to greater civic engagement and prosperity. After the war, the return to the star system and the individualist expressions of action painting or the subversion of classicist pictorial composition in abstract expressionism all over, or in the minimalist one thing after the other, all disavowed the aesthetic and ideological tenets of the section. Moreover, the gaze of some American artists upon Italy shifted, focusing rather on the multi-layered historical incrustations of its monuments, entropy, ruins, graffiti, catacombs, things of Twombly, Rauschenberg, Smithson, Paul Tech, James Wines and uh, site architects, among others. Wielded against American mass culture and the standardization of suburbia, when Robert Smithson visited Rome in 1961, he declared that, quote, the broken icons of Byzantium inspired me more than all those insipid equine figures of the Florentines. The polemic against the commodification of the easel picture and art for art's sake put the section on a similar plan with modernist movements that sought to free art practice from the manually produced unique piece. But rather than embracing serial production and new media technology, the section attempted anachronistically to reconcile the erratic artwork on the wall and the democratic production and fruition. Fascinated by the artistic production of a pre-capitalist society, but acting with modern bureaucratic determinacy, the section ignored that historical murals are multimedia works embedded in chapels and sites that rarely are the result of a preordained figurative plan. They are palimpsests, reworked and re-signified over the decades. This organic and diachronic dimension of art 
is what later American artists appreciated about Italy, rather than dreaming to transplant the cultural myth of her past into a panacea, as Bruce once said to Roosevelt, against the, the, the destructive effects of modernity. Thank you. Well, I just want to add my voice to the chorus of thanks uh, to everybody uh, from Melissa. Uh, by now, we all know their names, but uh, just because I'm not saying them doesn't mean I don't appreciate all their hard work. Um, explanations of uh, Philip Guston's rich but often misunderstood career typically slot him into a distinctly American trajectory in the following terms. A prominent figurative painter, and we just saw some examples, uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, Guston was a belated convert to abstraction, swayed in that direction by developments in New York uh, in the 1950s. Then late in the 1960s, the story goes, Guston shifted back uh, to figuration, a controversial move at the time that culminated in the monumental pictures like this one that he created in the 1970s. This binary opposition of figurative versus abstraction as absolutes has long structured analyses of Guston's oeuvre, characterizing him as a painter who seesawed back and forth between these poles. But Guston's work often appears neither entirely figurative or abstract, or uh, both at the same time. That is to say, in many of his paintings from the early 1950s onward, uh, he merges a lush, expressive handling of paint with an enigmatic uh, kind of storytelling. The application of medium in frame, for example, has a life of its own that exceeds its descriptive role. Broad expanses of color are enlivened by free gestural brushwork, uh, creating delicate furrows that refract light. Numerous pentimenti create layers of other colors and incipient forms beneath the surface. Even earlier, more abstract paintings show these same proclivities. In 1958, Georg Baslitz, then a young painter, saw a selection of Guston's work, including uh, the mirror in Berlin in Alfred H. Barr's exhibition, New American Painting. Baslitz admired Guston's technique, recognizing how he overlaid paint lever layers to create a figuration lying dormant under uh, the surface of an ever-shifting abstract composition. While Basilis appreciated the painterly ambiguity in this work, uh, Clement Greenberg, for example, uh, dismissed Guston's abstract canvases from the 1950s, like this one, as, quote, homeless figuration. The poet William Corbett, part of a group of writers uh, very close to Guston in the 1970s, made two observations about Guston that I'd like to explore further here. <clears throat> he wrote in his memoir, quote, uh, about Guston, quote, while his New York colleagues broke down barriers and brought abstraction into the mainstream, Guston was a latecomer who, uh, um, oddly enough, arrived at abstraction through Europe, end quote. Three pages later, Corbett zeroes in what he finds striking about Guston's paintings of the 1950s, like a zone. <coughs> quote, they have the dignity of refusing to choose between alternatives, of allowing contrary impulses to coexist, end quote. Dialectical thinking, of course, was all the rage in New York in the 1950s, and Guston certainly found that atmosphere very congenial. But here I want to explore a European context for uh, Guston's move to abstraction, which underwent, as I hope to show, a very critical phase in Rome in 1948 and the possibility uh, that he may have acquired there, too, a taste for reconciling these, quote, contrary impulses. Elsewhere, I have explored Guston's, uh, in depth, Guston's important third and final stay at the American Academy in Rome in 1970 and 71, 
His fascination for Italian painting from Masaccio to De Chirico is well known, uh, testified uh, above all by this painting from 1973. In 1948, Augustine paid his respects to Giorgio De Chirico. You see him there on the right in the latter's studio in Piazza di Spagna. Uh, having first encountered uh, De Chirico's The Poet and His Muse uh, in the Ironsburg collection, which was then in Los Angeles, where Guston grew up in 1932. Guston, so identified with Piero da Francesca, as we uh, saw uh, just a second ago, that when Dory Ashton, the author of a major critical biography of Guston, uh, published in the 1970s, asked him to draw the frontispiece, uh, for her book, he sketched himself in the uh, tight-lipped profile uh, and prominent nose from Piero's famous uh, portrait of Federico da Montefeltro. Gustin later admitted that Roberto Longhi's monograph of Piero was the only book he never returned to the library. <laughs> I will focus instead today on uh, uh, Gustin's sojourn as a Rome Prize Fellow in 1948 and 49 and his association with a younger group of Italian artists, actually living at the time. It is still a shadowy episode, and for that reason, and assuming that Gustin was only interested in the old masters, few scholars have given this period much attention. Uh, one exception I should note is Barbara Drudi, who has ventured some important observations about his relationships with certain Italian artists and the repercussions of his time in Rome. And here I'm showing you on, on the left uh, a caricature of uh, John Helliker, uh, uh, drawn hastily on the corner of a, a paper table uh, covering from a trattoria in Rome, uh, which depicts Guston's friend, who was also a Rome Prize Fellow in 1948, in profile, uh, uh, like uh, the emperor on a Roman coin. And uh, in 1970s, as Barbara suggests, Guston revisited this imperial formula in the large cyclopean heads that often appear as surrogate self-portraits uh, uh, in the late paintings. <clears throat> in an annual report, Academy Director Lawrence Roberts notes that during his fellowship year in 1948, quote, Mr. Guston traveled extensively in Italy, France, England, and Spain. In painting, he produced little. But on his return to America, he was able to sort out and translate onto canvas his experiences and impressions, end quote. Now, Gustin confirms this in a letter addressed to Roberts dated in December 1949, so after his return, uh, writing from Woodstock, he says, quote, I am work, at work on painting, and much that I was thinking about in Rome seems to be coming out at long last, end quote. Now, this period corresponded to a moment of transition, even creative crisis. Dory Ashton called Gustin's year abroad a period, quote, fraught with anxious moments, end quote, in which he only painted sporadically. According to Ashton, Guston's, quote, exposure to Europe brought his long period of dismantling to a climax, end quote. In 1964, prompted by poet Bill Bergson to talk about his time in Italy in this period, Guston replied, quote, I had painted, note the past tense, I had painted pictures like the Tormentors from which the descriptive elements of earlier pictures had been stripped away. I went around Italy looking for what I felt was painting for me, Renaissance painting, and then the Venetians. I did a series of landscape and architectural drawings in hill towns, and I went to Paris and 19th century French paintings for the first time." End quote. Guston revisited this period in a talk in Yale, this time in 1972, uh, uh, asserting that he arrived in Rome after a period about a year in which he contended with a split that had developed in his work. Quote, everything seemed unsuccessful to me, and I couldn't continue figuration. How to explain that? The forms I wanted to make couldn't take the shapes of things and figures. In other words, a sort of split occurred. And after about a year of destroying paintings, this picture happened. He's referring to the tormentors, uh, which I felt OK with. Although there were still remnants of figuration in there, but I felt I had to drop figuration. I mean, it just had to go. It was a very lengthy struggle to do that. I felt torn, you might say, between conflicting loyalties. The loyalty to my own past and the other loyalty of what you might still do or what you might still become, which is, of course, unknown. That seemed to me the pattern of my life as a painter." End quote. 
This pattern of conflicting loyalties and the strategies that Gustin developed to deal with them after a lengthy struggle, I think, is crucial to understanding his work. Now, he began to explore the elements of the composition in Tormentors and its various motifs in two important drawings from uh, 47 and 48, and the painting was most likely, if we believe his later account, already in an advanced state, perhaps finished, prior to his departure uh, for Italy. And this is the second uh, uh, drawing, which he actually later called drawing number one, as if it were the beginning of an important uh, new cycle. Now, the painting next to Gustin in this photograph of him in his studio, which you just saw at the Academy, uh, may be the unfinished tormentors, which is subsequently cut down, the measurements don't add up, uh, uh, to its present size, um, or another similar painting that he later destroyed. Both share a similar visual language, even though the shapes vary from one to the other, spidery white lines, an ominous black background, a somber airless space, and wedge-shaped forms in red and ochre, standing out against a nocturnal field. I hope you can make it out. They're clearly uh, different paintings, because the same shapes uh, are not there, but you can see some of the similar language in both. In tormentors, the solid uh, forms give way to voids defined by a tracery of filaments punctuated by fewer uh, red uprights. What is clear, though, is that Gustin was struggling in Rome with a large composition not unlike the one in tormentors, and he was evidently working more than he led on uh, later on. In fact, in May 1949, Gustin applied to extend his fellowship for a second year, although he ultimately he decided not to stay, and in the renewal letter he writes, quote, while throughout the year I've meditated much and sketched in plans for my own painting, I have only recently begun to work on new canvases, end quote. This painting is like tormentors scarred by Gustin's anxious struggle to pare down or strip away his figures to a more elemental abstract language. Now, Gustin was attempting to dismantle even further the already compressed figurative language in earlier paintings like Porch uh, number two from 1947, which was partially inspired by photographs the artist had seen uh, by Margaret Bourke White and others of the survivors of the Nazi death camps. Many of the motifs, shoe soles, two by fours, are carried over and echoed in the later painting in uh, the form of outlines piled on top of each other in a similarly claustrophobic space against a black background. To give you an idea of how radically Gustin had stripped down and compressed the spatial coordinates in his work by the time he arrived in Rome, we need only look at the painting that won him the prestigious Carnegie Award in uh, um, 1946, uh, here on the right. Uh, and in fact, when this article appealed in Life magazine in uh, May 1946, he was already working in a very different idiom, as we can see from the paintings behind him, all of which he subsequently destroyed. The accompanying article asserts that Gustin, quote, prefers his more abstract canvases, which are filled with moody symbols, end quote. The flattened overlapping legs and feet and musical instruments in the painting directly behind him <coughs> recalls, of course, the language in Picasso's Guernica, uh, which was on view at MoMA in the 1940s, having been sent there for its safety, and setting the standard for politically engaged a painting inspired by the horrific catastrophes of the Second World War and the struggle against fascism. The painting on the easel in his Academy studio in 1948 with its dense collection of flattened overlapping forms looks more like the Guernica inspired paintings behind him in the life photograph. Uh, uh, I hope this is clear. <laughs> then uh, um, uh, then does and, and suggests that Tormentors represents a subsequent a step in which Gustin further stripped away the form, scraping them out or painting them over. As Michael Alping has pointed out, uh, the artist's symbolic imagery, hooded figures, shoe soles, and the like, here is veiled in the very act of applying paint. Now, uh, Gustin followed Tormentors, uh, sorry, 
with Review, now at the National Gallery uh, on the Mall, uh, which also, I think, may have been begun in Rome. In both works, Gustin is both stripping away form and piling on paint practices that would characterize his work for the rest of his career. Uh, note the division of the composition and the contrasting uh, bands of red, lighter on the bottom and darker on the top, a compositional structure uh, uh, that Gustin would return to in many paintings from the 60s and 70s. And the pentimenti, too, are uh, significant as the network of white lines that have been painted over but continue to lurk between the surface of the darker pigment in the upper part of the painting. Now, Gustin devised the linear armature underpinning both of these paintings in Italy. On the island of Ischia in early 1949, or perhaps after his return working from a tourist postcard, uh, uh, Gustin made a series of three drawings in which he progressively reduced the tangle of terrace streets of Forio into a schematic grid concentrated into and radiating out of the center of the sheet. So this is uh, an earlier drawing, and this is uh, later, or a subsequent step. Progressively, the spidery lines and undulating domes are reduced to a more rigid geometrical system of cross-hatching punctuated with diacritical marks. We can compare the transition from one drawing to the other to the passage from tormentors to rev and review to Gustin's more completely abstract paintings executed upon his return. The filigree of lines and wash in the drawing on the left and their evocation of superimposed volumes resemble the scaffolding with similarly delicate lines in tormentors, where they seem to be etched into the canvas. <clears throat> I think the Ischia drawings, uh, with, its uh, with its architecture of solid forms almost completely dissolved into lines and voids, proves that Gustin worked on tormentors when he was in Italy. <clears throat> The much more concentrated vortex of interlocking lines in the drawing on the right then provided the underlying armature for Gustin's completely abstract paintings, such as Zone in the 1950s, painted upon his return. There, working with a limited repertory of brushstrokes, Gustin translated the graphic grid into a conflagration of color that both congregates in the center of the composition and radiates out from it. Now, despite clear evidence of these Italian coordinates, American critics at the time read paintings like Zone very differently. Caught up in a revival of interest in Claude Monet's late Waterloo paintings, two of which were acquired by MoMA in, 40, in 1945 and 46, setting off a whole-scale reevaluation of Monet's late career, critics attributed Gustin's paintings from the 1950s with their meditative mood, flickering color, and smaller pattern brushstrokes to a phenomenon they called abstract impressionism. According to American painter Louis Finkelstein in an article pu published in 1956 uh, in which he cited Gustin, abstract impressionism aimed to re-emphasize the visual experience as a subject for painting, insisting upon, quote, the compatibility of abstract and representational modes. Well, he got that right, but Gustin was not looking at Monet, at least if we believe his comments uh, uh, to Bill Bergson in 1964 who asked him to describe what he saw in Paris in 1948. Gustin replied, quote, I saw the Monets, but I didn't care for them, end quote. Now, in 1949, before his return to New York, Gustin posed for another photographer, this one working for Life magazine, John Phillips, and he sat in front of a painting that looks a lot like at what we've just been looking at, an earlier version of Tormentors or a painting that he may have destroyed. <clears throat> now, these photographs were shot for an article about artists in Rome, uh, published later the same year, August 1st, uh, but the pictures of Gustin were not included. I think the finished article helps us uh, get at who Gustin was hanging out with. Oddly enough, the spread ignored many of the American artists who were in Rome at the time and chose to feature only Italian artists in an article that emphasized their political affiliations in a Roman art world riven by ideological differences, or at least on the surface. The positions were staked out officially uh, when the head of the Partito Comunista Italiano, Palmira Togliatti, writing under a pseudonym, published a tirade against abstract art in November 1948, prompted by an exhibition organized by the Fronte Nuovo 
at Delle Arti and mounted in Bologna. He called the things he saw there, quote, a, a collection of monstrous things, end quote. This essentially forbade card-carrying communists for painting in an abstract idiom. Henry Luce, the publisher of Life, well known for his anti-communist sympathies, and I think this may explain why many of the American artists in Rome in 1948, like Gustin, were excluded from the article. Caricatured in the caption, for example, accompanying the photograph on the lower right as being feted by his aristocratic sponsor, prominent socialist realist artist Renato Guttuso, who publicly sustained the party's position after Togliatti's article, is described here as, quote, the only prominent red artist who changed style to meet party's ideals, end quote. Pietro Consagra, uh, on the other hand, a sculptor and militant for the Partito Comunista, attempted to remain true to the ideals of the party while continuing to pursue his exploration of abstract forms. According to his friend, Ugo Pirro, who documented the lively debates that took place well into the night at the Osteria Mengi uh, uh, on the Via Flaminia, quote, a revolutionary party should promote a revolutionary art, end quote. Consagre, in the caption accompanying the photograph of him singing a, quote, anti-American song, refuses to obey party edicts on art. These captions suggest both the degree to which the post-war Roman art world was polarized along party lines and the way in which artists maneuvered between them. Uh, similarly, Adrian Duran, in his focused study of the Fronte Nuovo, uh, the, an artist group uh, deeply engaged in renewing Italy's avant-garde in exactly this period, cautions us against allowing the numerous exclusionary binaries, East versus West, Communism versus Democracy, America versus Italy, to reduce, quote, post-war Italian painting to a Manichaean battle between two stylistic categories of realism and abstraction, end quote. I should note that Gustin arrived in Italy in D September 1948, which was uh, the most vibrant and, and also volatile year of the post-war period in which the new front of the arts, the Fronte Nuovo, and its heterogeneous platform would receive wide recognition at the uh, 24th Venice Biennale. Um, so Gustin would have been there to absorb the fallout from Togliatti's diatribe and the reactions to it. Still, Duran emphasizes that despite Togliatti's strictures, Italian artists navigated between the two categories which remained fluid, often attempting to reconcile them. He proposes a more nuanced model, one of simultaneity and oscillation rather than singularity or binarist mutual exclusivity." End quote. Now, ideological tensions and attempts to evade them permeate, permeated even the relative calm of the American Academy in Rome, where Gustin was not the only artist experimenting with abstraction. Italian-American artist and former GI, Salvatore Scarpita, seen here second from right, uh, worked in a studio there for three years after the war where he befriended Gustin. Accused, quote, of getting a little too involved in Italian internal politics, quote, unquote, he was asked to vacate his studio at the Academy, guilty only of trying to solidify his standing with left-leaning friends suspicious of him because of his American passport. Similarly, Salvatore Meo, who moved to Rome in 1949, setting up a studio in the Via delle Quattro Fontane, also found himself pigeonholed simply for being American. Art critic Cesare Vivaldi remembered an occasion in which the painter Giulio Turcato, a friend of Consagra's, having mistaken Meo for a re reactionary American, harassed him with sarcastic barbs. Now, all of these artists pursued abstraction on shaky ground within a matrix of conflicting loyalties, none more so than Scarpita, who, as Raffaele Baderida has pointed out, called himself, quote, Mr. In-Between, for precisely this reason. Despite his difficulties, Scarpita remembered a porous, fluid atmosphere of exchange. Quote, the American Academy was a survival space. On the outside, or shall we say the inside, was Italy, humanity, politics, the competition, let's say competition, and that's where I began with the abstract movement in Italy. The Communist Party didn't like our attitude towards art, but accepted us because we had a certain crescendo, a certain popularity. 
We also made friends among leaders of the Communist Party who were not that sectarian about their approach to art." End quote. Federida put Scarpita among the group of young uh, uh, people dancing in a basement of the painting by Guttuso that was read at the 1954 Venice Biennale as a biting critique of post-war Italy's taste for all things American, including abstraction represented here by Mondrian's famous painting, Broadway Boogie Woogie in the background. But we also might read this as evidence painted by an artist who was perhaps less doctrinaire than his, uh, this painting suggests of those in-between spaces and strategies where artists fraternized and found middle ground in a politicized artistic landscape. It's most likely on this trip that Gustin met Italian artist Piero Dorazio, one of the artists lampooned in Gust uh, Gutosu's painting that you just saw, uh, seen here with Gustin in New York in 1962 or 63. Dorazio, of course, was one of the founders of the group, uh, group Forma Uno, uh, seen in a photograph on the right, whose manifesto declared that they were, quote, formalist and Marxist, convinced that the terms Marxism and formalism are not irreconcilable, end quote. Their platform pro pro proposed to mediate between abstraction and realism, and it's interesting to think about Gustin's uh, exchanges with this group uh, and Dorazio in particular, as he was struggling with the same question of expressing his political commitment in abstract terms. Gustin was no stranger to Marxism or to art in the service of leftist social and political agendas. In 1934, after having met David Alfaro Siqueiros in Los Angeles, he went to Mexico uh, to paint a large mural with two friends on a huge wall and the f in the former, on the former palace of uh, Maximilian in Morelia. Gustin's enthusiasm for Mexican muralists was tied up in uh, uh, his membership uh, in the Los Angeles branch of the John Reed Club, a Marxist study group which encouraged artists to, quote, abandon decisively the treacherous illusion that art can exist for art's sake, end quote. And the motifs in Tormentors, as we've seen, hark back uh, to those Gustin first developed for a portable fresco, now lost because it was destroyed by uh, uh, hoods uh, inspired by the trial of the Scottsboro Boys. So it's significant that Tormentors broke down the very visual language that he had used in these politically engaged works. While Tormentors was like Porch, a response to the horrors of the Holocaust, it is significant that images of atrocity and execution were also precisely the kinds of subjects embraced by Italian artists, uh, including Guttuso, as part of their uh, renewal of art and re-engagement uh, with life immediately after the war. The progressive dismantling of Gustin's painting as he moved towards abstraction reached an epiphany in Italy. His attempt to reconcile political content expressed in fragmentary and ghostly forms and abstraction demonstrates real affinities with practices characteristic of the Italian avant-garde in 1948, where many uh, artists attempted to achieve in Duran's words, quote, a synthesis of engagement and formal experimentation. Now the cultural and literary historian, Mary Louise Pratt, offers a nuanced framework to explain the complexity of American experience in Rome after the war, coining the term contact zones to describe, quote, social spaces where cultures meet, inform each other in uneven ways, and where they clash and grapple with each other, often in contexts of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths, as they are lived out in many of the parts of the world today." End quote. So a contact zone allows for interaction so that cultural, cultural boundaries can be broken and transgressed. And, and while Pratt's scholarship is uh, focused on the colonial encounter in South America, we might consider post-war Rome too as a kind of contact zone in which, despite mutual admiration, Americans and Italians faced off in an increasingly unequal and often antagonistic relationship shaped by post-war reconstruction and the Cold War. The move to abstraction in the work of these artists betrays signs of uh, transculturation, which is one of the strategies uh, identified by Pratt, uh, along with mediation, collaboration, and imaginary dialogue. 
So transculturation was first defined by Cuban uh, uh, anthropologist Fernando Ortiz in 1947 describes the process whereby members of a subordinated or marginal group, and I think we can put an expatriate artist in a foreign country into that category, uh, in which they select and invent from materials transmitted by a dominant metropolitan culture. Inured to the artistic hegemony of New York in this period, we usually assume that the transmission of abstraction must have, must have only flowed only in one direction across the Atlantic. The focus has been on what Americans brought to Rome rather than what they learned there. And I think that despite its newfound superpower status uh, after the war and the growing authority of its modern art, uh, and Italian artists at this moment were yearning to find out what was going on in New York, that's clear, uh, the United States still remained a kind of cultural upstart with regard uh, to the August traditions of old Europe. We've seen that Gustin admired Piero La Francesca and Giorgio di Chirico arrived in Rome in awe of Italy's cultural preeminence. Now just one more example and then I'll finish. Um, Nicholas Carone, another American artist who had actually won the Rome Prize before the war but had to defer it, he settled his studio on the Via Marguta, where his nearest neighbor was Italian sculptor Pericle Fazzini. Uh, and Caroni reco recalls later, I lived not as an American. I lived with the Italians. I wasn't just a tourist. I set up a studio and lived there. I associated with most of the Italian artists. I knew them all, Afro, Basaldella, Mirko, Basaldella, and Renato Cutuso. He had indeed his first show in Rome in 1947 a gallery, uh, in a gallery sponsored by uh, the, those very Italian artists he mentions. Um, and Guttuso wrote the preface to the catalog. Uh, in uh, a later interview, uh, Carone underlined the benefits of that aesthetic climate, working with the Italian painters, and his uh, attentiveness to their fluid non-doctrinaire strategies. Of course, 1947 was before Togliatti's uh, diatribe. But the important thing is that Cutuso, in his essay, uh, and you're seeing an illustration from uh, uh, two of Carone's paintings from the catalog on the left, uh, Cutuso insisted in his text that all the paintings in the exhibition were profoundly Italian in character. And uh, another thing to note that it was, of course, late 1948 and 49, when one of the artists that Carone mentions, Mirko Basadella, designed the bronze gates for the entrance to the Fosse Ardettine, the site of one of the most horrific atrocities perpetrated during the Nazi occupation of Rome. So uh, while, uh, uh, and critics as assailed M Mirko's project on the basis that his abstract forms, divorced from descriptive or narrative function, were unsuitable for that site. So Gustin left Rome before this controversy really heated up, but I think he surely would have appreciated the embattled effort, so similar to his own tormentors, to find abstract forms capable of memorializing the victims of World War II and the Holocaust. So in restoring Rome to its place as a dynamic fulcrum for international dialogue after the war, we can begin to unpack the role that those exchanges played in the development of a work of even a singular artist like Philip Gustin. What to American criticism looked like rudderless oscillation between figurative abstract and peers in this context, like a deliberate strategy of reconciling the two, which he forged in part, at least in part, in Rome. And speaking to Joseph Abloh in 1966, Gustin summed it up, quote, I felt as if I was talking to myself, having a dialectical monologue with myself to see if I could create and these problems revolve around problems of abstract painting, non-objective painting, or image making. And of course, I'm seeking a place, an area, where these questions would be dissolved, where they don't exist, where somehow, in me, all of this would come together. Thank you. Most sincere thanks to the organizers, and um, I have to echo Sergio by saying how much of an honor and a privilege it's been to be a fellow at SAM, um, especially a George Gurney fellow, um, which is of course a line dedicated specifically to the study of sculpture. 
Um, I'm not going to be talking much about this image, but I thought it might be particularly fitting at a conference dedicated to cultural exchange and um, differences in language. Uh, it's a drawing that Alexander Calder sent to Giovanni Carandente in 1963. Carandente had asked Calder to do um, a project for him at a bus stop. Um, and you see here uh, Calder essentially saying, I've thought about this project a lot. All I can come up with is a big F. And uh, you know, he says here, which would mean fermata to Italians, but something else to Englishmen. <laughs> During the summer of 1962, the Italian curator and art historian Giovanni Carandente organized Scultura nella Città, or Sculptures in the City, an exhibition of national and international contemporary sculpture installed throughout the ancient hillside town of Spoleto, about 100 kilometers northeast of Rome. The exhibition was groundbreaking, with Carandente choosing to show the work not in a pastoral countryside or an urban park, but embedded in a layered, lived fabric of a city. Carandente's desire to highlight the contemporary, to show how sculpture was materially connected to and altered by everyday life, evoked a tradition of displaying sculpture in the Italian peninsula that stretched back to antiquity but also made a conscious decision to juxtapose modern, mostly abstract sculpture with the surrounding architecture. His curatorial vision did not look to the ghosts of the past, to what he called Italy's outdoor museum to its classical Gothic and Renaissance past, but rather to the possibilities of the future. Carandente utilized sculpture's inherent responsiveness to the space it occupies, but did so squarely within the particular context of the 1960s, a moment in Italy marked by rapid economic growth and socio-political upheaval. Scultura Nelli Città made explicit connections between the emergent post-war industry at the root of these changes and the concurrent embrace of new materials, growing scale, and unconventional display strategies being deployed by contemporary sculptors. No work perhaps better encapsulates the aims of Scultura Nelli Città than David Smith's epic Vultry a series of 27 sculptures the artist created in just 30 days that Carandente masterfully installed together as a group in Spoleto's ancient amphitheater. Smith was one of 10 sculptors asked by Carandente to create work in mills owned by Itelsider, um, the national steel concern, and the resulting work emerged physically and conceptually from the materials Smith encountered at the Voltry Center. In just one month, he created roughly a fourth of all of the work shown at Sculptura Nella Città. Smith's output was covered in the national and international press in an almost exasperated tone of maniacal artistic explosion. One critic referred to it as a, quote, creative bender of awesome magnitude, end quote. <laughs> Today, the achievement of the Voltri has largely eclipsed the importance and impact of the exhibition which often serves as little more than a contextual backdrop or a footnote within Anglo-American history. In discussing the Voltry today, my goal is not to further this line of Smith-centric scholarship or minimize his accomplishment, nor will I provide a comprehensive overview of Scultura Nella Città. Smith was not the only American artist to create monumental sculpture for the exhibition or even in Italy during the 1960s. And I would like to instead consider the Voltri within this broader, if because of time, still selective context. Alexander Calder produced uh, Teo de Lapio, his first large scale public. Oh, this was some of the criticism. Alexander Calder produced Teo de Lapio, his first large-scale public stabile sculpture, still in situ next to the Spoleto train station for Carandente's exhibition. And seven years later, Robert Smithson realized Asphalt Rundown, his first large-scale outdoor sculpture, or earthwork, in a disused quarry on the outskirts of Rome. Facilitated by the Italian gallerist Fabio Sargentini and involving several tons of hot, oozing asphalt dumped down a hillside, Smithson's Italian intervention may initially appear diametrically distinct from Smith and Calder's steel abstractions. 
Examined together, however, these projects suggest an acute engagement by American sculptors shaped by the lasting legacy and contemporary implications of what could be called an Italian sculptural monumentality. Monumentality and the related term monument have and continue to have, as we have been uh, very much reminded of this year in the United States, a long, complicated semantic and material history. None of these three projects should be considered as a monument in the traditional sense, as something akin to a statue or a sculpture or other structure used to commemorate a person or a historic event. They do not memorialize anything, <laughs> nor do they serve as symbolic representations materializing some collective consciousness. I also do not intend to discuss them within the context of the anti or counter monument, or to quote Rosalind Krauss, as ontological absences. The logic of sculpture may be inseparable from the logic of the monument. But for Krauss writing in 1979, the modernist epic saw the inversion of this relationship, with sculpture becoming monuments negative condition, rendered nomadic, ripped from its pedestal, and untethered in its existence as not landscape, not architecture. An idea that resonates with Lewis Mumford's assertion 40 years earlier that, quote, if it's a monument, it cannot be modern, and if it's modern, it cannot be a monument. While Smithson's intervention could certainly be discussed in such contrarian terms, I'm more interested here in the condition of these sculptures as monumental, as conceptually grand and physically imposing. In short, in their express monumentality. The mid 20th century marked a sort of crisis point for monumentality, especially in the wake of the deployment of monuments and monumental scale by fascist regimes. As Siegfried Gideon argued in his 1944 essay, The Need for a New Monumentality, however, the impulse to create, quote, things that remind, things to be transmitted to later generations, cannot be surpassed, end quote. What strikes me in Gideon's words is the evocation of temporality, of the passage and continued presence of the past bound to matter a temporality that could be extracted from memorialization. The paradox of the timeless and the contemporary, the permanent and the ephemeral, would of course serve as the cornerstone of Smithson's artistic practice. In his essay, Entropy and the New Monuments, published just over 20 years after Gideon's, Smithson declared that time was now reduced to, quote, fractions of seconds, not the long space of centuries, with both the past and future placed in an objective presence, end quote. For Smithson, this compression of the passage of time, or as he described it, the coming and going of things, was at the heart of his fascination with Rome, which he called a junk heap of history. Smith, Calder, and Smithson all conjured powerful allusions to Italy in Italian history, while simultaneously manifesting conceptions of temporality at the heart of contemporary discussions of monumentality. It would be too tidy of a correlation to claim. American artist goes to Italy, sees monumental sculpture, and in turn creates large monumental sculpture. The fact, however, that Calder, Smith, and Smithson each embraced a new sense of scale while working in a built environment famous since antiquity for its monumentality, both in regards to size and grandness, is neither insignificant nor coincidental. They each engage with the Italian urban landscape to their work's most utmost advantage and relied on Italian intermediaries to realize those projects. The resulting works, the Voltri, Teo de Lapio, and Asphalt Rundown, are distinct sculptural projects created with vastly different intents and approaches, but collectively they suggest a monumentality shaped by an Italian imaginary, not just the grandeur of the past, but also the layered, complex temporal and physical manifestations found in the present. 
Italy, or more particularly the cultural legacy of ancient Rome, has proven a perpetual source of inspiration for American artists, as we've already heard so much about today. Um, but for sculptors in particular, a physical and conceptual touchstone for a certain type of epic grandeur and classical lineage, though such influence is less commonly associated with the art of the 1960s. Smith, Calder, and Smithson, however, all asserted that their Italian encounters proved formative in their careers. And as Smith recalled of the group of 10 sculptors, and you're, you're seeing just three here, Consagra, Lorenzetti, and, and Beverly Pepper, um, for those 10, um, Smith said, um, it brought out, all, quote, it brought out all the, the best in all of us. Calder did his greatest work there, so did Chadwick, and Consagra, and Pomodoro, and Franchini, the whole Italian group, end quote. Within the extensive literature on Smith, some scholars have taken the context of place, specifically the vulture's creation in Italy, as an invitation to attribute classical and archaic sources for each of the sculptures and to tie his work more closely to the country's artistic patrimony. Similar connections or references have also been discussed in regards to his previous work. But while Smith was aware and interested in classical Greek and Roman sculpture, the most palpable influence and strongest connection to Italy was not its ancient history, but the country's more recent industrialization. If the language of the Volturi works were foreign, different than Smith's previous work, it was not Latin or Greek, but vernacular, present-day Italian. Smith took the specifics of his site, of the local environment he found himself in, and developed new forms while continuing to explore his trademark tensions between figuration and abstraction, intention and chance, found and created objects. The experience of working at, as Ital Cedar's guest palpably manifested itself in the work he produced. As Smith would write to Karen Dente, quote, this was the most productive period in my life. I am grateful to Etelsider for the freedom of their mills and factories, for their interests in my work with unlimited material and their generosity. The fact that all works are called Voltri is my affectionate regard for Etelsider's center at Voltri." End quote. In addition to the conditions of their creation, the Volturi are forever linked to Italy due to Carandente's curatorial solution to the problem of having so many unexpected sculptures to display. He installed almost all of the pieces in Spoleto's ancient amphitheater. By all accounts, Smith was tremendously happy with the decision, frequently commenting on the curator's brilliant idea of the forum, and those are Smith's words. He was effusive in his insistence that his work had never been treated better. In another of Smith's letters to Karen Dente, um, he declared in the postscript, quote, for the rest of my life, I shall be part Italian. And although I am stupid, I shall try to learn the language, end quote. <laughs> and uh, actually, Voltri uh, 6, which is at the Nasher, um, actually has this kind of scribble that you can kind of see um, just down here. I'm sorry, I don't have the point, uh, just right at the base of it, uh, andiamo a Spoleto, and it's again another kind of uh, linguistic tie um, to the place of their creation. With, while the monumentality of the Voltri came from the massiveness of their creation as a group and their subsequent collective placement in the amphitheater, Teo de la Pio was perhaps its most lasting, uh, perhaps the most memorable and monumental single work of Scultura nella Città and is certainly its most lasting symbol. Calder's sculpture stood over 65 feet tall and 45 feet across, and was the first of numerous monumental stabiles that would transform Calder into one of the most ubiquitous and infamous uh, public sculptors of the late post-war period. It is now almost impossible to go to a major city and not see a large-scale large painted steel sculpture uh, by Calder in front of a building placed in a plaza or tucked into a park. And I'm just showing you two very you know, random kind of selections, though one, of course, is nice because it's here in DC. As site spe uh, specificity became an increasingly valued element in public art, Calder's work has often been criticized for the seeming detached neutrality of both its creation and placement, studio created, enlarged by fabricators and steelworks, and indifferently plopped down in an urban setting, as Richard Serra is all too happy to tell us all the time. <laughs> the same 
and in my opinion, unfair opinion, uh, or uh, my opinion, which is also thinking it's unfair, uh, of this critique, could be leveled at Teo de Lapio, but like many of Calder's public commissions, the circumstances of the work are more complex and connected to site and the legacy of monumentality than they might first appear. In Karen Dente's initial contact with the artist, he sought, quote, a Calder mobile to use as a sort of triumphal arch at the entrance to the city to symbolize the whole exhibition. While the form and location of the final work would change multiple time, be, times between Karen Dente's first letter in March and the installation of the sculpture in July of 1962, the allusion to gateway monuments would remain a, con, uh, a constant. By the end of April, Calder had decided to change the form of the work, sending Karen Dente a sketch and a description, which you see here, um, that would, quote, stand on the ground and arch the roadway. Karen Dente had estimated that whatever work was installed at the site, posts would need to be at least 10 meters high so that vehicles could still traverse the space. Um, but as Calder responded, and you can see just at the, the second page there, um, he says, quote, I doubt if you'll have any vehicle go that high. Five meters ought to be enough, and, if, and anything taller can go around. <laughs> Karen Dente was so pleased with what he described as the modern town gate for Spoleto that he decided in early May to place the work in a more visible, if logistically very similar location. Throughout the entire process, the curator sent Calder numerous photographs and descriptions of the site, and in turn, the artist designed the sculpture with the location and context of the exhibition in mind. Calder did not personally make the work and was not present in Italy during its fabrication at the Itosiera de Savona Center, just west of Genoa. The correspondence between the two men suggests that Calder had wanted and tried to travel to Italy during the process, but due to scheduling conflicts, largely his exhibition at Tate, um, simply sent a maquette and instructions to the worker at Savona, declaring that they would know better anyways. Following the multiplication of Calder's model by 27, the pieces of the then untitled sculpture were sent to Spoleto, where it encountered numerous problems during its installation. Due to the resulting monumental size, the work had to be moved to a third site. It was actually like hitting a, la a lamppost where it was supposed to go. Um, uh, and the, the third site, which was the Piazza Giovanni Polvani, adjacent to the town's main train station. Karen Dente was quick to convey to Calder that the sculpture would still fulfill its original function and form as a modern gateway to the town. Assembling the 11 meter, uh, millimeter thick sheets of steel, usually used for the hulls of ships, proved difficult and ultimately quite unsafe, causing the work to be structurally unsound and unable to withstand Spoleto's high winds. Karen Dente and his American colleague in Spoleto at the time, James Johnson Sweeney, summoned Calder uh, to Italy, sending a telegram that simply said, come quick, danger. <laughs> and of course, uh, Calder's response, which is so wonderfully Calder, love danger, coming quick. <laughs> Once arrived in Spoleto, Calder watched as the metal workers reinforced the work with additional steel plates. And it might be kind of interesting to note, and you can see it in the, the photo of um, Calder and Karen Dente at the front with the other men, uh, that the work itself was kind of not finished, i.e. painted, until much later that year. And actually, Ito Cedar kind of put up a little bit of a fight about, well, why do we have to paint this at all, right? Like, it's steel. Let's just show it as steel. So there was a little bit of tension there. Calder also named the work on a whim after seeing a print of an Umbrian duke wearing a crown hanging in his hotel, and the reference to a historical figure who perhaps would have once been the subject of an equestrian monument in the piazza um, was not only visible in the tipped form of the sculpture, but also in Calder's subsequent and repeated personification of the work. Um, Calder writes of being delighted to see his large size about coming into Spoleto, and uh, he actually follows up and pursues this opportunity to receive a gift from the city of uh, Spoleto of an apartment so that he could come and visit Teo de la Pio. And for any artist doing public commissions, you need to up your game and get an apartment out of it so you can go see your work. Um, Teo de la Pio also immediately became the figurative and literal gateway to the city, welcoming visitors to Scultura nella Città during the summer of 1962 and every year since. 
the sculpture made a powerful first impression and provided an effective introduction to the overall conceptual framework of the uh, exhibition. Mostly abstract, uh, large in scale, made of industrial materials, fully incorporated into the folds of the surrounding urban space. As Karen Dente wrote uh, in a letter to Calder, quote, your participation in the exhibition can be summarized as follows. Idea, mobile, intention, stable, result, eternal, magnifico. <laughs> Before concluding, seriously, I don't see how we're ever gonna take this down, so it looks like it will have to stay here, end quote. <laughs> and stay in Spoleto it did. Following the conclusion of the exhibition, Calder gifted the work to the city with lots of stipulations, uh, where it has remained ever since. Its outline still appearing on uh, the city's municipal bus tickets from since 2010, so it may have changed, but I doubt it. Um, Calder's international reputation contributed to the heightened status of the work, but its size, placement, and relationship to the surrounding locale was equally, if not more, responsible for the widespread population and acclaim. Created seven years later, on the morning of October 15th, 1969, Robert Smithson's asphalt rundown seemingly bears little resemblance in form or intent to the Voltri and Teo de la Pio. It's several tons of hot, oozing asphalt, a strong contrast to Smith and Calder's solid steel. Its site of a disused area of the Cava de Sece, a rock quarry approximately 18 kilometers southeast of Rome, near the Roma Ciampino Airport, very different from the populated, historically rich streets of Spoleto. Its creation within the emergence of an international climate of art as process in the late 1960s, making it feel light years away from the largely autonomous permanent objects that had dominated the modernism of the early 1960s. Like his two compatriots, however, Smithson's encounter with Italy would significantly impact his career, leave a mark on the Italian landscape, literally in this case, and form an additional link in the history of American artist's evocation of an Italian monumental imaginary. Asphalt Rundown was a seemingly straightforward, singular act, but done on a scale that Smithson had yet to realize in his work. The piece became the first of several large-scale outdoor sculptures he made prior to his untimely death in 1973. As would be the case with those subsequent works, Smithson relied on external assistance in order to realize Asphalt Rundown. The opportunity to work in Italy had come at the invitation of Fabio Sargentini, who had invited Smithson to exhibit at his Galleria Lattico in Rome. Much like Karen Dente, Sargentini had a very clear vision of how national and international vanguard art could showcase both the legacy of Italy's past and its vibrant present. Sargentini, along with other gallerists like Gianenzo Sperone, were already accustomed to the innovative three-dimensional work being created by their own stable of artists, and I don't really mean that to be a pun, but obviously it is with this image, um, including Giovanni Anselmo, Giannis Quinales, and Michelangelo Pistoletto. Italian gallerists had helped create an environment, a network across Italy in the late 1960s that pr proved a particularly welcoming place for artists from both sides of the Atlantic seeking opportunities to experiment with new approaches to sculpture. The chance to create a piece in this open environment proved especially significant in the case of Smithson, just as the Cava de Salce uh, proved a particularly rich physical and historical location in which to enact asphalt rundown. The selection of this site, however, owes more to Smithson's involvement with Sargentini than it does to any artistic conceptualization or conscious choice. Sargentini had first met Smithson while on his trip to New York in April of 1969 through the art uh, dealers John Weber and Anina Nosei, and subsequently invited Smithson to show at his massive new gallery space in a former parking garage in Rome. Smithson realized Asphalt Rundown at the end of an intense year of travel and exhibitions that saw him visit Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom shortly before and after his exhibition at Latico. Smithson flew to Rome directly from Prospect 69, uh, the art fair in Dusseldorf, and was back in New York within a week of Asphalt Rundown's realization. Um, his calendar looks really intense for those three weeks. Um, Smithson wrote in advance of his arrival, asking Sargentini to scout for a suitable, accessible quarry location. 
Sargentini was responsible not only for choosing the specific site, but also for procuring all of the necessary raw materials, the machinery, um, and human resources. And, and there's a very good story that Claudio Abate, the, the photographer that shot the kind of iconic photograph of this work, um, tells about Sargentini coming into his studio in the morning, grabbing him by the ear, throwing an espresso in his face, and saying, let's go, um, and, and forcing him to go out there and, and take these images, because he quite didn't get the work at the time. Um, Asphalt Rundown was very much a product of the exhibition strategies and collaborative patronage models that emerged in Italy during the late 1960s. It was a precocious act that represented a complete break from the traditional means by which to create and display art and a definite break from the traditional understandings of monumental large-scale sculpture. While its realization in an outdoor setting was still a fairly radical move at the time, the work remained beholden to and entrenched in the greater enframing space of the institutional context provided by Sargentini's gallery and the embedded specifics of its Italian site. The circumstances of Asphalt Rundown are in part due to good timing or happenstance, but Smithson realizing his largest work to date in Italy in an industrial quarry near Rome almost seemed predetermined. The Rome of antiquity, along with its ensuing ruins, had long gripped Smithson's artistic consciousness. Writing in 1967 uh, of his tour of the ruins in reverse of, or, or monuments of Passaic, if we want to call them that, um, Smithson wondered whether the industrial New Jersey town had replaced Rome as the eternal city. The pumping derrick, the, the answer is no, it did not replace no. Um, the pumping derricks abandon construction sites and buildings, and even there's some displaced neoclassical uh, sculptures actually placed in the photographs that Smithson took. You just, they're not uh, re reproduced here. Um, these, these, these photographs um, he encountered on his suburban American journey have a clear affinity with the disused quarry on the outskirts of Rome, all filled or marked with the presence of out-of-date things and a discredited idea of time, to use Smithson's words. Unlike the pipes of Passaic, however, the Cava de Seche referenced an accumulation of the past, a, quote, historical background of debris, end quote, that locations in the United States could never match. As Smithson stated, quote, you might say that my early preoccupations with the early civilizations of the West was a kind of fascination with the coming and goings of things. And I think this is what fascinated me in my early interest in Rome, just this kind of collection, just this junk heap of history, end quote. Smithson spent the, his career paradoxically, paradoxically creating remnants and asked Sargentini to find a very unmonumental banal site, away from the grandeur of Rome. While Asphalt Rundown can be understood as its own ruin in reverse, its sense of time is far more complicated and acutely connected to the industrial monumentality of Calder and Smith's ship hull steel. Smithson was certainly open and welcome to the idea of his work disappearing, of the inevitable power of entropy, but he discussed asphalt rundown with a distinct air of monumental permanence. He described how the work was rooted to the contours of the land, that due to the density of the asphalt, the work was not ephemeral, and that while subject to weathering, would be, quote, permanently there, or at least should last for quite some time, end quote. Like the group installation of Smith's Voltry, asphalt rundown did not stand the test of time its material eroding completely away over the last five decades. What Smithson referred to, however, as the, quote, sense of something being very definitively in time, while simultaneously giving you a sense of timelessness, end quote, was the foundation of Asphalt Rundown, and is another way of describing the temporal paradox, the intertwined physicality of past and present, of the monumentality also visible in Smith and Calder's Italian works. All three sculptural projects were not site-specific, at least in, in terms of how that, that term is deployed today to designate usually a socially engaged artwork or intervention made for and irremovable from its site. Each were very much late modern manifestations, made um, largely self-referential, autonomous sculpture that while heavily dependent on the structures of the art world, could at the end of the day still function elsewhere. 
in any gallery, just down the street, as in the case with the dispersed ball tree, in any urban public plaza, as is so often claimed of Calder's large-scale works, or in any quarry or industrial landscape, as Smithson would do in his two subsequent dumps following in the wake of asphalt rundown. To think in such terms, however, is to apply what I think is a too narrow understanding of the relationship between large-scale sculpture and site. The context of Italy, of Spoleto and Rome, directly shaped the Voltri, Teo della Pio, and Asphalt Rundown, and provided each artist the opportunity to work in a scale and size they had not yet been able to realize. To look at the photographs taken of these works installed in that environment is not just archival due diligence, but a means to truly understand the profound connection of sculpture to site. All three projects resisted the classical notion of the monument while simultaneously engaging the layered histories embedded in the fabric of Italy stretching back to antiquity. The Volturi Teo de la Pio and Asphalt Rundown did not replicate the fragmented blocks of marble or borrow the form of bronze statues, but instead suggested a new monumentality for the post-war transatlantic world, one that reflected the poetics, power, and possibilities of industrial materials, and in the process became things that continue to transmit to later generations. Thank you. I would like to ask everybody to please save your questions for the end of the day, and we're going to take a 20-minute coffee break out in the lobby, so please join us. We'll start back up at 4.30.